and we are live with Life Action Roleplay. Yes, I got it out with, who, who's our co-host? Ryan uh, or... Go for it, Kai. Okay, uh, with uh, Kai Norman, he, him. Ryan Omega, he, him. And Cynthia Marie, she, her. And we've got two lovely guests. Would you guys like to introduce yourselves? Uh, starting with, let's go with Kelly. Hi, everybody. I'm Kelly Lynn D'Angelo, and I'm she, her, they. Hi, everybody. I'm Diana Leonard, and I'm she, her. Yay, welcome. So excited to have you guys. Um, all right, as you guys can tell, I'm the one who's leading today, so um, things may seem a little bit different, but that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. Um, so we're going to start off with a shout outs. Does anybody have any shout outs? Kai, do you want to start? Um... I think the only shout out right now I am in full like um uh like event prep mode because uh my my LARP is doing another one of its online games um starting Saturday and going into Sunday. Um so if you have an interest in that kind of uh post apocalyptic uh role playing and things like that, um then by all means check out Dystopia Rising Northern California. Uh but otherwise I uh I I'm kind of brain frazzled with like very hyper focused on that right now. So, no worries. Uh, Ryan, what about you? My shout outs to the various casts of Boardroom Armageddon, Purgatory Cafe, and Game Over Video Chat. Uh, I am very, very pleased and very happy with just the sheer amount of talent and performances, not just from established role players, but um, up and coming streamers, and I'm incredibly proud of all of you. Oh my god, um, the promo for Devils tomorrow will be insane. But uh, also, uh, Sin, you killed it as Simiel um, at Purgatory Cafe. Like everyone in Purgatory Cafe, damn, hey, <laughs> so good, so much fun, so much fun. Um, Diana, you yeah. have a shout out. I do. My shout out is to the Novo show, which has been a lifesaver during the pandemic. Uh, I'm often in the chat and Novo is just a darling. And I call it Novo Samar because especially early in the pandemic, I definitely took some naps to her playing um, uh, Animal Crossing and it's very relaxing. Right on, right on. Kelly? Um, I'm going to give a shit out, a shit out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> actually it feels appropriate to Retromation. I am obsessed with YouTube, like let, let's plays. Um, he's kind of like, and I, I've been following him since he had a few thousand subscribers, but now he's like at 60 K and his content. I go to sleep like every night listening to it the past year. So check out his undermine play. It's amazing. Right on, right on. And my shout out is actually to our fellow Siren sister, Christina Ariel, who is the new host of Star Wars. Uh, what is it? Star Wars Republic, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go check her out. She is incredible. And I am so excited for her to be doing that. Um, go show her so much love and support on her Twitter because she's, she's a little nervous about it and excited all at the same time. So Christina Ariel, Go check her out if you haven't. And she has been on the show before, and she mm -hmm. was on D and D Live. And as I mentioned, she is uh, Kelly and I's siren sister. So go, go, Christina. I love you. And yeah, yes. Moving <laughs> on. Um, so today we are going to be talking about a a bit of a hot button subject: culture appropriation versus inspiration. Um, and I, I want to do a, a, uh, a warning. Um, this could be a little bit touchy for some of us um, here. We're going to share some of our experiences um, as being POCs. Uh, so please, please, please be kind to us. Um, we are opening the chat for questions, um, but I can't stress this enough. Uh, we will be vetting the questions. If there is anything that makes us feel uncomfortable, we do reserve the right to not answer your questions. So please, keep them as educational, friendly, something that you would ask your friend, not an enemy, or try to target somebody on social media. Like, just, just keep it nice, y'all. But you guys are nice anyway, so, like, I don't, I'm, like, preaching to the choir here. That's cool. <laughs> anyway, um, so I wanted to start off uh, with the definition um, of culture appropriation, and I'm using appreciation instead of inspiration, but I think kind of dual purpose here. And the reason why I'm starting with a definition is I like to get everybody on the same page that we're, start, we're talking the same terminology instead of interpretation of um, terminology. So from, I have two definitions for cultural appropriation. One's from a quick wiki um, search. It's the unacknowledged or inappropriate adaption of the customs, 
practices, ideas, etc., of one people or society by members of another and typically more dominant people or society. So that's from Wikipedia. But one that I actually really, really liked was from verywellmind.com. And they say that it refers to the use of objects or elements of a non-dominant culture in a way that doesn't respect the original meaning, give credit to their source or reinforce stereotypes or contribute to oppression. Um, Diana, did you, anything you wanted to add to that? I really like uh, that because it's focusing on power and dominance is an important part. The only thing I would add, if I missed it, apologies, but that power can be situational, right? So there can be a situation in which a group that's normally uh, not empowered becomes empowered. Uh, so we want to keep track of that. But then we also want to take into account that power surpasses the situation and is something that can come to us from the broader society, even if in the local setting, power dynamics get disrupted. So uh, both need to be brought into account. Good point. Good point. And I would just tag on even to that description. I, I liked the second one a lot. Um, oppression and erasure. I think the yes. erasure part is an important element to it, too. Yep, yep. Um, so on the flip side, culture uh, appreciation um, is when you earnestly seek to learn about or explore different culture. You learn, you listen, you strive to understand, and you seek to honor its beliefs and traditions. Really like that a lot because I, I feel like often that gets lost on people where learning, listening, and honoring that culture, it, to me, is, is, is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so my first question, we're going to keep it light here. Um, I wanted to go around the room real quick and find out everybody's, um, culture. Like what, what is our heritage? Where, where did we come from? What was our background? Um, so I did send these questions in advance. So everybody kind of had like a, a fair warning of what I was going to ask. So specifically, please describe what your race slash culture is. Um, let us start with Mr. Omega. Okay. Um, so I am Filipino American. I'm second generation um, Filipino. So my parents both came from the Philippines. My last name really is Omega. It's not Omega as in this is the stage name. No, my last name really has that. Um, I come from a certain part of the Philippines that if your last name is Omega, uh, we are most likely related. Um, we got this last name because it is a biblically Spanish last name. So if you know the uh, Christian Bible or Catholic Bible, um about the alpha and the omega that's where we get our last name so that is um where i come from the one interesting thing about um my raising that uh being raised is that my dad actually moved here to the u.s when he was 13 uh to oakland california so he so he was here um from the 1950s and that definitely affected how he saw things and raised me um, because he was very American as a result. He also ended up being very conservative because he was um, and went into the military. So like that also affected um, the way I was raised. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you want to explain your background real quick? Your background? Do you want to explain it? Brian. Oh, sorry. Do you um, want to explain your background? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, like I thought you were talking. Um, so my background, <laughs> if you can see it, like um, has my mom and my my aunt, my Tita Levy. And um, it just happens to be my mom's birthday today. And uh, I also just realized, you know, wait, isn't it early? And I realized she lives in the Philippines right now. So so it's like, oh, yeah. So that's, so that's my mom. You can sort of see the resemblance. So there you go. Yay. All right, I'm going to throw it over to Diana. Hi. All right. Well, I have um, a mixed race background that includes Creole heritage. And my parents were an interracial couple, which was a very complex situation growing up in New York City. And so I do identify as a mixed race black woman, but I also understand there's a lot of passing privilege and a lot of color privilege that I have that has been uh, a challenge and a kind of a beautiful thing to share with, for instance, my sister about the things that we experience being perceived different. Uh, ways. She lives in Atlanta and has a very different cultural experience than me living in Portland, which is much more, uh, um, it's a very white city and I teach at a predominantly white school. And so that's been interesting. 
I've also found that my mixed race background has been really helpful in mentoring students at my college because they often struggle with issues of identity and place in uh, society and in the college setting. And so we get to have really great discussions unpacking that and myself and other folks in the college staff and faculty get to do some mentorship for them around those topics. So that's been really great. I also have Central American and Indigenous heritage, but nothing that I'm culturally connected to directly. Uh, so I don't always bring those up in discussions when asked what my racial background is. Awesome. Uh, how about Kelly? Hey, everybody. I'm Kelly Lynn D'Angelo. And as you can tell from the last name, I'm mixed. Uh, my father is second generation Italian American immigrant, fresh off the boat, Ellis Island, that whole thing. Uh, but then on my mom's side, I'm Haudenosaunee, Tuscarora, Mohawk, uh, Guyangahaga, and Blackfoot Cree. But my tribe is Tuscarora, Haudenosaunee. Uh, that's my Grammy. Uh, that's my background. She, <laughs> she comes from them, them land. She's actually grew up on the Muscopitang Reservation in Saskatchewan. You know, the dynamicism of Indian heritage is complex, and we were all different nations that all intermarried and have our own dramas. Um, so that's a little bit of my background that has brought me now to you. So awesome, awesome, awesome. Love it. Kai, we're not going to leave you out of this. Can you tell us a little bit about your background, please? Oh boy. Um, milk? I don't know. Um, <laughs> so I am. Uh, I'm from England. Uh, my heritage, I would say, is probably a mix of English, Scottish, and French, uh, because uh, like a thousand years ago, some aspects of Normandy, which is a part of France, invaded uh, England and kind of kicked a significant portion of its ass. Uh, but yeah, lots of um, that kind of area. And I immigrated to... Uh, America um, when I was 19? Yeah, 19. Mm -hmm. So I've been here a fair amount of time now. Um, um, and I guess me, um, I am Puerto Rican and Cuban. Um, I identify more with my Puerto Rican side because um, Puerto Rico and Cuba do this a lot. Um, but within Puerto Rico, um, we're actually uh, combined a Spaniard um, native, uh, Taino or Borinquen, um, native and um, African. So Puerto Ricans come in an array of different looks and you can actually like never really truly know like if you encountered a Puerto Rican or not. And really like Caribbeans in general, like we, we all come in various different shades. So like if you're in New York, like they're Hispanic culture, Caribbean culture is all over the place. But um, my background today is Puerto Rican flag. Um, I was gonna have a coqui up there and explain a coqui, but I'll just leave it at the, at the flag. Diana, I saw, I saw excited fingers. What's up? Did you have coqui for Christmas? I made coquito for the first time <laughs> in my life. I was so proud of myself. It came out so good and I'm probably gonna have to make it again and send you a bottle. <laughs> I will accept, I will accept it. <laughs> oh man, I was so proud of myself to make that. Cause like I, I am a terrible cook. Um, so like, don't ask me to make rice and beans or platanos or any of that, but I'll make you a good coquito. <laughs> <laughs> Um, speaking of drinks, actually, I did miss a question here. What is everyone drinking? Uh, let's, um, 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 Diana, let's start with you since you were already off mic. I'm ready. Um, I have uh, the this uh, Marionberry soda from Hot Lips in Portland, Oregon. I have to represent locally. Uh, this is available in around town. I don't know if it's available in California and other places, but uh, it's very sweet, but it's good. It sounds delicious. Yeah. Nice. Sounds so good. I mean, I'll lead. I'll lead up with that. Uh, I don't know. I guess this is from Oakland, California, man manufactured there. I, I discovered these in in a store like a year ago, and I've been a local market, actually, a local deli, and I've been getting them since. So they're Olipop. I'm drinking a classic root beer soda. It's prebiotic soda. One of these babies got 36 percent of your dietary fiber, kids. I said the S word earlier in this podcast. So if you need to make sure your, your body's clean, get one of these. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's where we're going. Um, Kai, what are you drinking? You always have something fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Super, super fun to go with the, the trend of being, um, uh, well, yeah, um, I'm drinking just water. <laughs> like, I'm not being interesting at all today. 
Um, I am drinking inside of a D&D mug. It is a combination of lemon tea and guarana tea. <laughs> so, uh, very... It'll keep you keep you awake. Not that I need more awake for um, for this podcast, but it's just kind of energizing, and I really like it. Nice. Um, I I am joining Kai, and I am drinking the most original and most incredible and classy water. <laughs> I do have to say that you were pulling that glass. you were pulling that up to drink, and because of your background, it looked like the most interesting beverage that's ever been made. Like it was. <laughs> amazing i was very excited yeah i, I love it I, I i only drink water in in a wine glass because i feel like it's just even classier okay so we we talked about what our race culture heritage is um i'm gonna go back around again and talk more about our background growing up um some of us have um migrated here some of us have moved um different coasts um, so I really want to talk about kind of like um, what city you grew up in, your kind of social economics growing up. Doesn't necessarily have to be right now. Um, da, 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 da. Predominant race of folk versus your race. Um, I talked about when I talk about mine, I'll explain why I had that in there. Um, and did you grow up around your race? Um, I think that that's going to be an interesting one. So yeah, just, just a little bit about that. I'm going to start with Kelly. Yeah. So my whole family, I'm from upstate New York. My mom, her siblings were born on the res, and they eventually moved off. I mean, they didn't have running water. Um, so when they were able to buy a piece of land, that's where my mother grew up. My father grew up in Buffalo as well. The parents on his side came off the boat. They went to Buffalo, and they started to just be a part of, like, the Sicilian community out there. So that's where my parents met, um, moved one whole hour away, good golly gosh, away from the family, which was, like, not okay, to Rochester, New York, which is where I was born and raised. Um, because of how poor my family was on both sides, uh, there was this old, this this desire to always give, you know, to provide for your children, to, to provide, provide comfort for them. And so, I did grow up in a predominantly like white neighborhood. You know, had a had a nice little tiny home on a corner um, in this tiny little suburb of Rochester, New York, that was kind of landlocked, both in ideas and in physical land. Um, most people there, born and raised, don't leave predominantly white uh but always grew up there not feeling like i fit in because every weekend because family ties are so important and so strong on both sides of the family we would drive one hour to buffalo and i would be spending the weekends every weekend with my italian side on fridays and then my native side on saturday or sunday and it was just like i grew up around my family like that's a lot of us have that experience especially when you have a, as large of a family as i do this beautiful woman behind me, my grandmother, uh, had 16 Indians running around. She had 16 children, uh, which created a crap ton of aunts and uncles and a crap ton of cousins, which created a world in itself, quite literally a bigger experience than my elementary and at times middle school experience. So my family was my life. And growing up with the dynamicism of, you know, most of my aunts and uncles on that side of the family not graduating high school, except for my mother, um, and kind of growing up with this like white culture on me, it created a very weird question within myself, which is why do I never feel like I fit in? Why do I feel so different when I'm with my family than I am around everybody else? And why am I such a loser? Nobody wants to hang out with me. Nobody wanted to be my friend. I was just constantly an outcast and I like nobody wanted to hang out with me. And it was like, I was, I felt like not just the black sheep in the community I was born and raised in, but also in my family um, in certain ways, because I had such a reverence and love for books and learning and had this like desire to grow my mind outside of what I knew. So that's kind of a little bit of the background of what I grew up with. Also socioeconomically, I grew up in an interesting dynamic in that though that side of the family had been kind of poor, the Italian side had made their kind of dues and like plumbing and other little areas to make money. So I kind of grew up with this like dynamic where native side still kind of work in the land, still didn't graduate high school, painted bridges, worked the farms. Um, and then one side of the family was like, kind of like go pursue higher education, make a lot of money and go be white. And so grew up with this like weird dynamic, not understanding any of this. And again, 
think that helps to give some context also comedically enough, just to paint the picture a little bit more. Uh, some people know the Haudenosaunee as the Iroquois, not the correct word, but thank you, the Hurons, for giving us that. Um, the Iroquois, uh, I come from a town, a suburb of Rochester called Arondequay, and our mascot was an Indian. So I literally just grew up around me being presented as dead. So just an interesting dynamic. Oh. Sin, you're mute. Sin, yeah, yeah, you're quiet right now. Sorry, I had to process that. That, that, that. So, okay, I made such a striking statement. Yeah. That I, yes. <laughs> Diana. <laughs> yeah, I would love to follow up on that because I had some commonalities, but actually a lot of differences that I think are kind of interesting. Um, because my parents were an interracial couple, at least for their family, they were rejected by both sides initially. And so I grew up bereft of family because of being mixed race in a lot of ways. Um, and so, you know, we had on my dad's side of the family, my dad's black, my mom's white, um, my dad's side of the family, we did have relatives living in Queens. I grew up in Manhattan, New York. Hello. Uh, and uh, they were living in Queens, but they were passing as white. So we couldn't go there because we would out them. So I never met my cousins that lived in the same city as me. Yeah. And then on my mom's side, they were all farmers in Kentucky. Um, so they used the N-word around me when I was a little kid. And my mom was like, nope, we're not going back there. So I really like, I didn't grow up with kids around. I didn't grow up with a lot of blood relatives around at all. Um, but we did have found family. And so that's become a narrative in my life. And, um, but as a result, I feel, I do feel like my social life has always been compartmentalized, which is funny because I also now live in Portland and spend a lot of my time in Southern California. So it's like, I'm still doing that thing. Um, but uh, so my dad had all of his best friends uh, who were living in Queens. And so we'd go over there for cookouts and I were, was friends with all of their kids. And my godmother was really active in the NAACP. And so I did service with her. And then my church community as a Catholic, hi, Ryan, represent. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, uh, most of my friends were Puerto Rican and Dominican. And uh, because of the way that I look, people perceive me as Puerto Rican or Dominican. And I remember there was a time when I was in a group with a group of my friends and an elder in the community was talking about navigating the world as a person of color from that community. And everybody was kind of like, we're like, maybe like 14, everybody's like fidgeting and like shuffling their feet. And the elders like, what, what's going on? What am I not getting? And they're like, well, she's not one of us. And the elder was just like, took a pause. But the, the second thing that happens, the elder took a pause, looked at me and was like, she looks the same, it counts. And then continued to share the wisdom, which, so you're getting a lot of mixed signals from people about where you fit in and where you don't fit in uh, growing up. So that's part of it. Also, um, I went to magnet schools, which were predominantly white or mixed race. So that was another piece of my social situation. So I'm moving from space to space to space, always never really able to settle. And that, that's kind of my parallel narrative. Oh, socioeconomically though, <laughs> sorry, I didn't get to that. Um, my dad uh, was very successful in radio and he was uh, one of the first uh, black men or black people to make it into mainstream radio, which was a big deal at the time. But he also was in mainstream radio because he didn't want to be marginalized and segregated and put on to, to a station where he felt like he wasn't going to have a wide listenership and be not paid, compensated the same way. So that was a big part of his story. Um, and I think he was very proud of how far he'd come, um, but uh, like three generations removed from slavery. But he, um, he was so proud that we lived in the apartment in Midtown Manhattan, but we couldn't really afford to do anything because he, that's where all the money went, was keeping up that image. So that was, that's that kind of piece. Yeah, nice. Mm -hmm. Um, Ryan? Yeah, all right. So I grew up in a town called Vallejo, California. Um, it is in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, Vallejo is known for a couple of things. Um, Vallejo is, um, was, a, was supposed to originally be the capital of California and then like po politics happened and they went to Sacramento. But Vallejo is also in the US one of the oddest um, combinations of people it is literally 25 percent black 25 percent white 25 percent asian 25 percent latino it is literally um that uh 
that's what it was composed of um, um, now. Um, when I was growing up, my dad uh, worked for Mare Island, which was like the naval shipyard. Uh, he is a nuclear, um, nuclear submarine inspector. He was actually the, um, the highest civilian person of color um, for, uh, as a nuclear um, submarine inspector all, uh, out of all of Mare Island. Um, but he kind of like swore like a sailor, which was different from the rest of my um, father's relatives who are devoutly Catholic and really religious. When I say devoutly Catholic, as in um, one of my aunts found, had a vision of the child Jesus in their bathroom. They tore down the house and they built a convent in that in that area. That is how religious they are. And my dad um, wasn't that. Uh, my mom, the fact that my mom my dad and I didn't, and my brother didn't go to church every Sunday, made us the black sheep because everybody else was devoutly religious. My mom had her own issues with the church and she's like, no, I don't want them to go to Catholic church. They could go to public school. It's fine. Um, as we were growing up, um, the first problem was that my parents spoke to me in a combination of Visayan, uh, which was the local dialect of the Philippines that they were in instead of Tagalog, which is a dialect that everyone knows, and English. So the first three grades, I grew up being thought of as mentally slow. So I had to have special um, tutoring for like from kindergarten through um, third grade. So you know, people, they all, uh, it was always strange that in classes, I would always have to sit in the back with a special tutor for them to explain to me what was going on until they realized, oh, it's because he grew up learning two languages at once and couldn't distinguish them. So they told my parents, you have to stop teaching him two languages at once. Otherwise, this will happen when they found out, oh, he's not stupid. <laughs> he's actually kind of smart, then they start putting me into the smart classes. <laughs> but for longest time, I actually thought that I was, um, I was not smart. Um, uh, also, uh, because I have a tendency to speak very, very clearly, um, they call it hyper pronunciation. A lot of voice teachers assume that I must have come from um, another country because I speak English so clearly not and not like a regular American I'm like that was really really interesting and that's not a, uh, a slant I just thought that was interesting it's like that's what I get for being second generation um, Filipino the other complication of being in Vallejo is because there's a naval shipyard it's a mostly blue collar town so the fact that I speak the way that I do I do get ragged on by other people of color of sounding too white constantly so i'm constantly called a twinkie or a coconut because brown on the outside white on the inside and that's not even and that was just kind of like what i was called a lot and after a while i just kind of had to laugh it off um also being in the closet the entire time just i decided to i was going to be too busy studying and being in too many clubs that i don't have time to date and that is why I could never come out in high school, especially with the number of times I've been called the F word um, in high school. Um, um, and it wasn't until I got into UC Berkeley um, where I was able to sort of come out, first came out as bi, because that was the safe zone during the time, and then eventually came out. But at the same time, I was morbidly obese. So I'm like, well, even if I was gay, no one want to date me because they look at me like, who are you? <laughs> so I had to lose a bunch of weight before I became comfortable being gay. So I've, I've been through a lot, not just being a person of color, but also being gay at the same time. That was a complication. But now I'm openly both of those things, and I, have, and I am better off because I have been both. <laughs> yes. Wow. All right, Kai. Where'd you come from? Oh, geez. Um, so I, I'm from a, a little, I, I'm going to make mine pretty brief because I actually don't think there's really anything that noteworthy on it. Um, I was definitely on or below the poverty level. Um, my, uh, my family uh, kind of separated and I, uh, I became, what's the right word? Um, I had a single parent. My mom uh, is the one who raised me for basically all of the time. 
and um, we immigrated to America because my dad was um, kind of financially stalking my mom, reporting her to with the IRS. I don't think it's normal for someone uh, to get, uh, or like, you know, the equivalent of the IRS in uh, England. I don't think it's normal to get audited every year for five years in a row, especially when uh, she really wasn't making that much money. Um, but she's a published sci-fi author, and that is specifically the exceptional alien clause is what got her to immigrate to America and allowed us to kind of escape him. Um, yeah. Um, in in regards to stuff, um, uh, I grew up in public schools. Um, uh, England has a lot more uh, socialism than America does. Uh, but uh, I, I don't feel like there's really anything terribly uh, noteworthy on it. Um, I was definitely the, the weird goth kid. I had super long hair. Uh, I wasn't super social with people. I got bullied a lot, and uh, I skipped a lot of school by pretending to be ill, uh, which in hindsight wasn't the best of ideas, but um, you know, uh, everyone has their own kind of coping methods, I suppose, with that type of stuff. And Diane, I can see you're kind of like, uh, giving me the thumbs up there. Um, but yeah, um, I don't really know quite what else to say. My mom's, uh, super badass and super tough. And, um, I always thought it was rather, uh, cool that as a sci-fi author, uh, she ended up getting, uh, you know, immigrating on the exceptional alien clause of immigration, uh, which I always thought was very cool. Uh, looking into it now, I've heard, uh, I found out that that actual thing is, uh, like the method of that is often kind of uh, used in a bit of a racist manner. Uh, like uh, that clause has been weaponized in certain ways, uh, which is a real shame. Um, but yeah, uh, that's how I got over to America. And, um, Sometime during Trump presidency, like the early years of it, was when I went from being a permanent green card owner to applying to become a citizen. And um, yeah, I ended up managing to be cleared as a citizen. So I'm now a full blown uh, citizen with a certificate and everything. I'm still waiting on the, uh, the gun and big hat. Uh, I have been promised those and they have not arrived yet. Uh, so, you know, uh, I realize that we are in a bit of a funny economy, but. Uh, still holding out my my hopes um but yeah noted noted gun and hat oh okay mm -hmm. i didn't know that came that came with the the territory there um, allegedly <laughs> <laughs> so um okay my my background um i should have been born in new york um but both my parents were born and raised in new york i'm a third generation puerto rican so meaning my Grandparents uh, migrated over from the island to New York. No, we are not illegal, contrary to what other people think. We're, we're, uh, Puerto Rico is, is, is a territory. So um, everyone came over, uh, pulled up in, in New York, specifically the Bronx. Uh, my parents grew up in the projects. Um, if people aren't aware what the projects are, they are basically the, the ghetto of New York. Um, so my family's kind of like motto is always like to climb that ladder um, and to to do better and succeed your your family and so my dad had an opportunity at 18 years old to move to California um, to work for a very specific aerospace company um, one that I work for today and um, married my mom at 20 and they came over to California by themselves um, within five years, they wound up having me um, and realized that they needed to make a life for themselves because they were carrying a, a child that they didn't want to have the same um, childhood that they had. So they moved up to a suburban um, city, which I also still live in. Woo! Uh, but um, it is a very, very, very um, white community. Actually, it's probably one of the most conservative communities in Los Angeles. Some people call it um, the red pocket of the democratic area in Los Angeles. Um, and it's very terrifying sometimes being a uh, person of color um, in, in it, but it, it is what it is. Um, but so I grew up um, as one of the few um, Hispanic kids. There's actually one other Hispanic person um, 
I went to a private school in elementary school. Um, so that kind of gives you a little bit of socioeconomic, like I, so like middle, middle class lifestyle. Um, my class in elementary school was pretty diverse, but I s still, um, had a lot of hard time. Um, I don't know if anyone remember it in 1992, there were two, uh, serial killers named the Menendez brothers. And because my last name, um, resembles that I was made fun of constantly as, uh, you are the Menendez sister and you're going to probably kill us all later. Um, yeah, I grew up with that. Um, I proudly turned around and said, nope, you're saying it wrong. It's Mendez. Like there's no double N. I'm sorry, do you know how to spell? <laughs> um, so I never really recognized when people were trying to put me down by the way I looked or sounded or anything. Um, in junior high, um, I was either lumped in um, with uh, my my brethren uh, of the Mexican culture, um, or people um, really understood what was going on when like Elian Gonzalez came over from Cuba, so they would constantly be like, "You wet back, you need to go back where you came from." And I'm like, "Ha, huh, sorry, do you know that Puerto Rico is a territory?" No, okay, go go back to geography class. Like, so I was constantly like, I would get hit with stuff and just kind of like deflect because I didn't really like understand. I, I grew up in, in a white suburbia. Like I look, I try to look like everyone else except I had curly hair. So I never had like good hair products. I would just have to like try to like straighten my hair all the time because that's all there was, you know? Um, like my mom has curly hair and she would straighten it. So she like had a hard time dealing with um, this mop of a, of a thing. Um, anyways, so um, as an adult growing into um, myself, um, I was constantly called exotic and where are you from? And like, you don't look like us, but like, you're really hot. And I'm like, eh, okay, that that's great. And then the moment I would say like, oh yeah, I'm Puerto Rican. They're like, oh, so you got an, an ass on you. And I'm like, uh, whoa, whoa. I, I'm not J Lo. I'm sorry. Like just because I'm Puerto Rican doesn't mean that I that I'm that. And they're like, oh, so then you speak Spanish, right? And I'm like, yeah. So I'm gonna break that there. Not all of us speak Spanish. My parents used it as a secret language so they could talk about my Christmas presents later on. So like, didn't learn it. I tried, I tried real hard. In fact, I'd be standing like around our family. Speaking of that, I actually didn't grow up with my family. Um, Dana, would you call it the chosen family, right? Or um, yeah. Uh, so we had a chosen family. Uh, it was also my dad's high school buddies who all moved out from California. So they all had kids and that was our family. Um, so they all spoke Spanish and during all the like birthday parties and they would be singing in Spanish. And I'm like, because <laughs> I can't speak Spanish to save my life. Um, I can say a couple of things that'll get me far like me duele estomago because my stomach always hurts. So I figured that one out real quick. <laughs> Um, and a couple of curse words and we're, we're, we're pretty solid there. Um, so as an adult, it became increasingly frustrating that I was losing opportunities, um, work related, acting related, um, because I didn't speak Spanish and everybody would just look at me like, why don't you speak Spanish? And I was like, you try growing up in California where you have six different Spanish teachers from six different places that speak different dialects of Spanish, plus your family trying to teach you how do they speak Spanish where they truncate all the words. So like, it just didn't work. I learned French faster than Spanish because I'm a ballet dancer. Like that's like, be real, it's kind of crazy. Um, so as a full adult now, um, like, so not like the 18 to 20, but like the, the, the mid thirties, um, I've been a lot more aware of, of my culture and, and who I am and the fact that um, it is so different. Like I have, my African side, I have my native side, and I have my Spaniard side. And for so long, I identified with Spaniard because of my relatively light brown skin, um, chocolate-ish, light chocolate. Um, I think that's what my makeup says, I think, something like that, I, or nutmeg. I don't know. Anyways, uh, so Kelly and I have talked about this. When I started really kind of pulling into my native side, I like had no idea how rich and beautiful the culture um, that I had. And when I found out more about native and talking to, to Kelly about being native, I got so scared to talk about it because like that you just didn't talk about these different things. And like when I try to identify with being native, I'm like, hey, like I know that I'm like, I'm not Native American. And like, I, I didn't experience or my culture didn't experience like what you guys did. But like, did you know that 
the Arwag Indians that, like, do not exist, like, the Taino and the Borinquen, like, we were one of the first to literally be decimated. I just learned this, like, like a couple of years ago, so, like, it, like, broke my heart. I also grew up um, in high school going to the um, African market place, so I, I have very deep cultures um, with, with, with um, Black, because my best friend was Black and stuff like that, so when I started talking about being Puerto Rican, I identify more with the black side and the um, Spaniard side that I never paid attention to the, the native side. So um, not too long ago, I actually got to do uh, my native makeup um, and put the full wig on. And I had to call Kelly. I like I literally started crying, putting the makeup on because I didn't realize like how part of my ancestry was so far removed from me that putting that on, like just made me realize like, oh, this, this is another, another part of my, my life that I didn't I didn't understand <laughs> that I had. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I'm just really excited to to um, learn about my culture now. I, I had no idea about my native side and it's, it's beautiful and it's amazing. Um, all right, I have one other question but I feel like we need to hit the the bigger questions here because we're, we're gosh, we talked about all about our cultures and none about like the topic. So let's get over to the topic specifically. Um, so I'm gonna hit um, a harder question that if we feel uncomfortable or whatnot, feel free to, to pull back and let us know that it, it, it that you're you're done talking for about it. Um, so what are some things about your culture that you've seen are inappropriate adaptions, representation, slurs that just down that are just downright offensive to you and you wish that people knew about? Um, at least for me, um, as a, as a Caribbean person, just real quick, I have a tough time with pirate culture. Um, it's just kind of a romantic view of uh, history that like doesn't actually pay attention to the fact that my entire culture was decimated. So there's that, I, I mean, I, I love me a good pirate costume. I love me a, a pirate movie, but like, let's be real, like that's romanticizing like a whole situation of the Caribbean culture that like people just have no idea about. So um, let's start with Mr. Omega. I'm uh, the big thing that has happened, um, at least among Filipinos for the longest time is often we're considered the second rate Asians if we are considered Asians at all. <laughs> um, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, when you look at other Asian cultures, they have a long, rich history, but people are not aware that when the Spanish came, one of the things they did was destroy, the very first thing the Spanish did when they arrived, um, a, aside from bringing Catholicism, was to burn all the libraries. That was one of the things they did. Um, in fact, um, when my brother went and researched like our own family history, it only, they only were able to go back six generations. The reason being the Spanish burned the records in the church. <laughs> so we can't go anything. We can't go past a certain point because there's no nothing to trace. Um, it isn't until, oddly enough, reality TV when we kind of get portrayals of Filipinos being dancers, being singers, when Filipinos start to come into their own and now we have a lot more positive portrayals of Filipinos um, because of reality TV. It's like, oh my God, they do all of these things. Um, and like um, shows like Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, which actually had a Filipino writer and then brought about like a lot of like, people who I'm like, I totally recognize those people in my family. Like that kind of like brought things along um, as well as uh, sports like uh, Pacquiao, um, Miss Universe, like Filipinos love the Miss Universe pageant. We love pageants, you know, all, all of them. I do. I always um, follow up on those. Um, but often with the philippines it's usually the erasure by not being as prominent as other asian cultures and also the other problem of the dynamic of um, philippines used to be called the sick man of asia because um how economically poor the philippines was in comparison to the other asian countries so that comparison happened but that also meant that philippines as a culture often went to other countries in order to send money back to the philippines to support their relatives so in that way filipinos tended to be industrious but we're also the party people we always throw a party for everything um that's why we tend to be host like that's why we there's a lot of nurses because it's always all it's always about 
Philippines is always the culture of hospitality, and I'm proud. I'm proud of that, and that that's kind of what the Philippines is to me. So Ryan, uh, am I right in saying that the uh, the platform that you have created with Life Edge and Roleplay is you indulging in your uh, your hostum to an extent? Yes, actually, it is. Like I like bringing different people. Um, onto live stream that don't get the opportunity to, especially if they're underrepresented, because I just have that compulsion of, I want to bring all of you and play with me. Please play with me. How do we do this? We'll make a channel where you can all play together and where we could talk about like important things. Where is it? Nowhere? We'll, we'll, we'll have a place. We'll have live action role play. And like part of it was Sin's idea as well. It's like, Ryan, we should do this. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Kelly. Um, what what representation? <laughs> uh, what good representation? I literally, absolutely hate every single version of every single native person I've ever seen in mainstream media. I have nothing good to say about any of it. Um, sorry. It's 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 a hot it's a hot topic. In, in that I have seen good representation by Native filmmakers on the indie circuit in the Sundance film circuit. Um, oftentimes, though, we're being forced into a very specific narrative for other people. That it, every single time we are being used, just as our people are consistently being used, just as our land is being used, just as everything about us is being used. Um, great, a, great a example that I get asked a lot, especially with this topic pocahontas like non-stop pocahontas asks especially in the cosplay community people asking me about can i cosplay as pocahontas let me tell you no like i will always tell you straight up no that is that is something that is sensitive to people who are sensitive to her story and if you know about what pocahontas went through that whole storyline as good as that damn music is steven schwartz oh that delicious music that i play and i enjoy and i celebrate because it's beautiful beautiful music and as much as i love irene who voiced her like there's so much talent involved with that movie and that character but when you pull back the covers having named her anything else instead of a young 16 i think she was actually 14 year old girl who went through a incredibly tragic i don't even want to talk about it past um she was a real girl and every other disney princess is in your fantasies but we continue to be pillaged and used for a different narrative so unfortunately i don't have any good representation and i'm excited to say working in the TV film space. I know for a fact some good stuff's coming out. Um, some really great things have been greenlit and moving forward with friends that I know in this community, but we are not there yet. So that is my two cents, my sassy two cents. Sassy it is, but well said. Thank you. Diana? <laughs> yes, first of all, I obviously have introduced you to Ember who decided to make an appearance during that. Um, my, my emotional surrogate cat. Um, that was a lot of truths. Um, I'm going to say two things real quick. I'm going to say treating slavery like it's fun or like it's something fun to explore, um, without really thinking about the degradation, cultural erasure, uh, genocide, uh, and so forth that happened because of transatlantic slavery. Um, and also <coughs> on the mixed race side, the tragic mulatto trope of the mixed race person so this is this is kind of there's a whole story but you know the Hayes code and how there were certain things that couldn't be portrayed in the media uh because of the Hayes code and so that's a reason for a lot of queer erasure as well uh and so uh where it's I think it's a little bit more commonly known now that uh queer storylines had to end in tragedy if somebody was even hinted at uh then they would die or be a villain um well the same thing is true of anybody who was of mixed race heritage who was the product of an interracial relationship they either had to go crazy or die or the the, the whole point of their story was that tragedy um, and disruption and being, uh, you know, community less. And I am community rich. And I think it's important to, you know, um, challenge that narrative. And so uh, I think that story gets perpetuated in a lot of different media environments today and in live action role play as well, uh, in some ways. So uh, just not a fan, not a fan of that. Yeah. 
Uh, I hear you. I think for for Latinas or Latin Latinx as we're now called, um, I think the biggest thing that that pisses me off is the romantic version of of Latins that we're always the Latin lovers and we're the sultry hot ones and like you can literally like Puss in Boots. They romanticize Puss in Boots because Antonio Banderas has a what sexy accent. Jennifer Lopez is what sexy. Uh, I can like name off every single Latin star and everybody always portrays us as sexy. Um, so I would love to see um, some more serious stuff from, from Latin artists, um, specifically Puerto Rican. So I'm, I'm going to be very specific. I know that Mexican culture is actually getting a, a lot of really awesome work out there and I'm like super excited for them, but like Puerto Rican and Cuban are, are very, um, very narrowed. So far, I think I've seen one TV show um, that is focused on on Puerto Rican culture, um, and still that's kind of weird. Um, Jane the Virgin does a pretty good job of kind of giving like the the Islander feel, which I was really like happy to see. But again, like it's just it's just not a lot out there, um, and I, I think there just needs to be uh, more talked about with with the Puerto Rican and Cuban culture. Oh, there was um, actually a really great one, but it's in Spanish. You can get it in like uh, in titles, but um, always a witch. Um, it's a really cool show that uh, features, what did you say, Diana? You're, you're on mute. Siempre, bru Siempre Bruja. Yes. 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 It's so good. Um, but they feature, this is what I was really excited about. They feature Afro-Cuban, um, Afro-Caribbean, which again, we don't, we don't get to see because we, uh, we get a lot of, um, pardon me for saying this, probably not the, the best term, but whitewashed. Um, you see a lot of uh, light-skinned Latinos. Um, there's actually a really good video um, from... I don't want to say BuzzFeed, but I think it is BuzzFeed. They actually do a whole thing about why um, Latins uh, basically erase uh, dark-skinned Latins. Um, but yes, Always a Witch uh, features an Afro-Cuban uh, woman. Um, she is amazing as a, as a Ruha and uh, going through time. And it's just really lovely to see the different um, mixes of dialect and skin tone and the way everybody looks, um, because it really does show like what uh, Caribbean um, lifestyle is like so there is like it's it's peaking out um, but I don't think it's as terribly mainstream and it's very evident when um, your former president um, thinks that uh, that yeah that Puerto Rico is still um, not a ter territory so yeah that was that was really bothersome and annoying um, can I jump back in real quick two okay. things one a positive portrayal that I like but that has gotten a mixed reception that was not intentional uh, is the show mixed dish which is part of the blackish grownish uh sh show with uh keenan bearish i think it's amazing um and i really felt seen by watching that in ways that made me ugly cry so just putting that out there and then also the m word that i used earlier to describe that trope that is an official term for that trope but please 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 do not use that casually or ever to refer to people because it's about the mixing of animals so that they can't actually have viable offspring um so um, uh, like a mule and it's basically relating people to animals that are yeah it's not good so never use it i uh, i I almost got bounced from a bar because somebody used it in reference to me and bad times ensued. <laughs> uh, Diana, for yes. our viewers, what is the correct term? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, so, it, you know, just like with anything, it's as the person identifies. And if it's appropriate to ask them, that's always the best approach, right? So uh, mixed race uh, is probably a pretty good place to start. Mm -hmm. Good to know, good to know, good to know. Um, Kai, I know, I know you're... you're you feel like you can't answer some of this but what like what are things that you've seen that you you would deem inappropriate like that's just ridiculous that you you've seen being uh every time there's a, a british accent being used in any kind of media it's by someone who's supposed to be either an expert or an evil super villain i i can assure you judging by the way brexit is going we are neither i was not expecting that but wow <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> um, me personally, I, I'm going to be really, really quick because I, 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 I don't think it's as nearly as important in any degree. Um, I really hate it when I see uh, like any kinds of like accents, especially mo it's particularly, in fact, modern accents being used in fantasy settings to depict something being exotic in any kind of format. Um, I 
I grew up in England. Um, I know a lot of other English people who feel a similar way to me. Uh, if you've ever played a Bioware game by the name of Dragon Age, there is an, a game called Dragon Age 3. Uh, there is a character in that, I believe, called Sarah or Ceres. Uh, she uses modern urban language in England uh, as like some of her vernacular. And the only way I could uh, like equate it to an American trying to understand how fucking weird it is finding modern speech in a fantasy setting is imagine the rather shitty like um uh like uh the 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 like gangster like and i'm not talking like mobster i'm talking like uh the the shitty black thug like gangster street thug kind of bullshit um, that stereotype imagine finding someone in a fantasy setting that is speaking like that um, one of the key things that Ceres drops all the time is the short, shorthand of uh, isn't it, uh, which is in it, and it is such a banal phrase that is completely ingrown into modern British like slang and everything uh, that like, if you're from England, you don't notice at all. Uh, I, I know that in California, I've gotten really used to saying like all the time. Uh, so I understand it being a like a local a dialect vernacular and so forth, but it's very much more modern. And um, like, yeah, seeing that kind of stuff rubs me the wrong way uh, pretty heavily. Uh, but yeah, like I don't have that much to complain about. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, so you led me into my next question because I wanted to talk about accents and costumes and movement and makeup, etc. So my next question really is in nerd culture, and I, I preface nerd culture like the, the white of it. Mm -hmm. um, what things have you seen that lean um, too closely to cultural appropriation that you just wish people just wouldn't do? Um, with, with that, actually, since I've got my mic on again, um, how closely uh, like Sin and everyone, do you think that kind of relates to the idea of like, when it comes to navigating what is okay to do and what isn't, uh, like how much should you really consider uh, like uh, things that are more of like an open wound? Like if something has been done to death, it's immediately something that you should veer away from, right? Or is that is that not true? Yeah, I would really like to talk to this actually because I have a lot of thoughts on it um, as quickly as possible because, you know, time is of the essence. Um, there's a lot of things that people shouldn't be doing. Um, pretty much everything. So let's let's pull it back. No, let's just let's just lay it down real quick. Everything native right now, take it out of your mindset because first, you have a lot of work to do if you are not native. You just do. You intrinsically have to teach yourself about like in a totally different perspective, get some history in there because you have been born and raised in condition to think a very specific way. You have been told very specific things growing up, especially if you were born and raised here in America in a predominantly white neighborhood and or were told or fed Texas instrument like history books, unless you went out of the way to try to inform yourself of a new perspective on history, you really, really need to get some context in terms of where this is coming from and why it's harmful to a living people that are breathing today. My family, my, my, my cousins on the res, like it's, it's so important first to, to work on that, especially with native related stuff. Please, if you ever see anybody dress up as that dude who stormed the Capitol recently, he was, he called himself a shaman that is directly related to native people. He has been stealing indigenous identity for years now. You should do a little bit. I mean, don't, who cares about him, but just know, just know that everything that he represents is a mockery um, of who we are as people. It's still vibrant today. And yet the conversation was still not had about our presence. So we don't even have a seat at the table yet. We have no seat at the table yet to be even begin these discussions. So any sort of appreciation of, of us has to come from a completely different space. And that's why it's very unique with native culture, I would say, compared to maybe some others that have some um, other presence or um, pop culture uh, resonancy. So there's a little bit of a different lens here, especially headdresses too, and especially eagle feathers. There's just like a long list of, a long laundry list of things that you shouldn't do. Um, 
but most predominantly, I want to talk about how do you appreciate, like, if you want to celebrate us, like, like, and you're like, well, crap, okay, so I got to read some history books, um, maybe, you know, try to understand why I've only understood people with the headdresses and with the feathers and like, you know, with that shaman thing that the dude was wearing and dream catchers, like first step back and think of all the elements and Google them. Google them and do some research on each one of those elements. Learn about their sacredness. Learn about the reasons why it hurts us that people wear them and continue to put that out into the world. Then if you really want to start to incorporate us and appreciate us, what you can do and what you should do is I think support native creators. There are native people out there right now making native fashions, making native earrings, making scarves, necklaces, beautiful accoutrements that you can fix yourself with. And you not only are you appreciating the current living culture that we are part of, but you're also contributing to artists and creatives in that space. Support and buy um, your, if you, especially if you want to create things with your own hands, support and buy from actual native people on Etsy who are maybe creating the raw materials that you need. Go visit a res and grab those raw materials. Like go, go and, and, and appreciate, like truly appreciate it. So that's my two cents. <laughs> uh, Diana. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think that that was beautifully said. I would add something that was in that, but I would punct punctuate checking your intentions and what are you trying to achieve by having this culture represented in your narrative and your story and what you're presenting. Um, and then I would also say, I think Googling is a really good idea. Um, and I, this is something that I talked about in the chat also previously. Um, being aware of the labor that's often asked of people of color in the community when they're being called upon to vet your ideas. Like, I think uh, the, the, sometimes it comes from a good place of like, I want to make sure that my friend of color is comfortable with what I'm doing. But then imagine that that friend of color gets asked every single time and that they didn't sign on for that labor unless they are in official capacity in the community where they've chosen to do that and put themselves out there for it. And so that's uncompensated labor that's exposing themselves to microaggressions, exposing themselves to being tokenized, exposing themselves to being held up as a monolith where they're say, when it's not maybe not even their culture, but they're just tangentially brown in the same way, uh, their say is then um, gonna be held up. Well, my friend said it was okay, so I'm doing it, it's okay, which happens, right? I, so again, I wanna put out there that a lot of these things are well-intended, but they just have a cumulative toll that they take on the community. And this is why sometimes you get burnout and you get people of color leaving the nerd community because of these factors. Ryan? Um, I think my situation is kind of unique in terms of being Filipino because um, of the whole not being acknowledged for a while um, as Asian. When you, if you mock, I mean, this is my experience, but if you mock someone who is Filipino, we kind of just laugh at that because it's like, oh my God, you at least recognize who we are. <laughs> and so it's just... So if someone tried to do a Filipino accent, like, no, this is how you do the Filipino accent. Like, no, the, the V is like a pronounced V, uh, V like a B. And so we'll actually, so it's a really, really strange way to, uh, you know, for Fili for Filipinos, because it's because trying to insult us in that way, it's like, it's really weird. It's like, you're a flip. It's like, yeah, and flip is a regular word. So, so that's a really weird thing I have noticed in my culture. So unless you actually intend like really, really hard to insult us, we just kind of laugh at you. <laughs> it's like, I know, I know you're trying, but that's, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, I will say that, um, to speaking to Diana's point that, um, there is a level of fatigue for people bearing the emotional labor of, um, trying to, uh, help correct people and or trying to assist people and trying to make sure that they're correct. One of the things that I consciously thought about when doing life action role play or appearing anywhere is um, I purposely signed on to take on that labor because if I can at least help you, the other person who is tired doesn't have to. <laughs> um, and it's important to at least, um, I'm not saying give yourself credit, you know, credit to me or it's not an ego thing at all. It's just that I know that if I can throughout this broadcast or some of our media 
be able to assist people with some of that knowledge, then it doesn't have to be repeated as often. And that is why having such a platform is important to me. And I didn't, it's weird. I didn't even realize that that was that important to me until I said it now, but there we go. I have, I have said it. Uh, to jump in real quick, I think that we need more peer education in this community around a lot of things, but including that, and that does mean people like you stepping up, Ryan, and I'm appreciative of it, and having these conversations in spaces that are mixed, spaces that are POC focused, spaces that uh, are white only spaces where folks can talk to each other about their fears and concerns about portraying characters and get feedback um, maybe in that environment. We need to just have more conversations and have more resources that are available to us in these communities. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And I also want to say this also goes for many people who are underrepresented. So this also uh, applies to people who are queer, all versions of queer. This also applies to people with mental illness, you know, people who are autistic, you know, people, um, people who have had actions uh, like people who are veterans, like a lot of these experiences are so important to acknowledge, um, recognize, um, and celebrate. Uh, so I am glad that I'm glad that our guests are here. It's like, I feel it's, it's going to sound weird. I feel so cool that you two are here discussing this, <laughs> you know, like, I don't know if that's a normal feeling for anybody, but I'm like, ah, I'm so excited Same. that Kelly and Diane are here. <laughs> So, Thank you. I mean, I'll take it. <laughs> Happy to be here. <laughs> um, so I'm actually in a lot of alignment with Ryan um, in terms of Puerto Rican culture. I feel like a lot of people really don't know what it is. Um, and so when um, in terms of fatigue, Diana, that you, you, you brought up, no one's ever actually asked me of my culture ever. They just assumed I'm something or um, they assume that I'm Mexican and when they find out that I'm not, they dismiss it of like, oh, you don't really have culture. Okay, I'm going to go like talk to the person over here. Uh, yeah, so being seen is probably one of the one of the big things for me, at least in, in nerd culture. Like, to be honest with you, I think the first Puerto Rican character that I could ever think of um, is um, Miles, uh, Puerto Rican Spider-Man, um, which was incredible to see in a movie setting that they did not erase who he who his heritage was like you heard his mom speak spanish to him and he replied in spanish and i really appreciated that so in the nerd world i think there needs to be uh, more representation of uh caribbean hispanic um heritage i think we have a very rich one and i think we have a very beautiful one um i think the most that people may see in nerd or under underground culture is the idea of voodoo um which predominantly gets associated with um with black culture and understandably but can i speak to that too yeah, go ahead. yeah. well i want to hear your piece on it but i definitely had that written down as something but i'm trying to you know hold back stuff honestly just as someone who is exploring my my religion, my 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 people's religion, um, being sent part Santeria, which is something I've actually never said it to anyone. I I'm I'm working on on embracing my Santeria side more. Um, reading about all the voodoo stuff and everyone like closely like identifying with with the black culture, like it it it's from the Caribbean too, y'all. Like, <laughs> uh, like look at Haitian, look at Trinidad, look at Cuba, look at Puerto Rico. Like it all. A lot of that started there. Um, I, I can talk about all the dances uh, that I've learned. Um, like go do like go do your research. Go Google what that stuff is because it is beautiful. Um, I know you mentioned something about not um, celebrating slave culture. Something in Puerto Rico we sort of do. Um, we all wear uh, white dresses um, and white headdresses, which was from the slave time, and we we do a, a whole dance called bomba. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and it is actually a celebration of our people because unfortunately that's what our people were reduced to. Um, so we didn't shy away from it. We, we created a whole thing around it, which is incredible. Um, and what, one of the things I learned and appreciate is it also, uh, Santeria specifically when you start dancing and stuff like that, it's actually um, doing prayer like stuff and like the slave owners just never knew that they were doing their prayers and stuff based on, on the dancing. So I like, 
love it. But go for it, Diana. Yeah. I have a quick story to add to that, but I want to give it give a plug to Janaea Kemper, who does uh, has done some work on cultural preparation for the Undying LARP in Southern California around voodoo and using that cult- culturally in that game setting that folks have found to be really good. And uh, I also have a Creole heritage, so I have ancestry that has a voodoo practice in it, but it's not something that I was connected to because definitely there was like a generational cleavage that happened was being taught that uh kind of connecting with Ryan said about learning two languages my dad was actually taught creole french from birth but then his dad who wasn't creole was like no 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 two languages in one head can't do it shut that down and so i don't have that language in my background so there's a lot of common threads here um but um i wanted to bring in the slavery example if you don't mind uh regarding something that i have done because i'm also gm for a larp in southern california called apocalypse 47 in which slavery is in the setting but it's a bandit form of slavery not chattel slavery not transatlantic slavery it is a bit different we try really hard to do that in a way that is historically relevant and that deals with these issues of trauma respectfully and to interrogate those issues and it's an opt-in only situation and you can definitely not play with those concepts in 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 many cases um we we try to give people levels of what they experience and they have that information up front Mm -hmm. um and so one thing that i did with that that i really I'm proud of, based on some uh, writings by Gabriel de Los Angeles, who lives in Washington State, uh, is um, about how to bring in historic analysis into LARP and to teach with LARP, uh, is that we did something looking at the use of um, quilts to communicate uh, the passage north for folks who were trying to escape via the Underground Railroad. And so I actually had folks in the community bring their quilts to the LARP, and we set up uh, a, a whole mod that was around investigating that. In order to solve that puzzle, you needed to read you needed to read children's books that had been written, that were being read aloud by somebody in the community who's a person of color, who's a teacher, who played a character, who read the books aloud, teaching about the historic Underground Railroad, and then the characters in the LARP needed to kind of piece that together to be able to understand how to solve the the mod, basically. I don't know if that made any sense, but oh, that, that sounded yeah. awesome. So, um, rolling back real quick to 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 voodoo, Kai, yes. you you had a point. Yeah. Um, so um, I go to an event. Uh, it isn't quite LARPing, um, though some people there do consider it as such. Uh, there's a post-apocalyptic event in California called Wasteland Weekend. And um, I am a part of a tribe that has gotten a little bit of uh, criticism because of the fact that they do have a bit of a New Orleans kind of vibe. Uh, at a certain point in time, we leaned a little too heavily into um, some of the voodoo aspects um, and immediately had met a huge outpouring of uh uh, people from that area that came to visit the event as a whole, because uh, some like 3000 people show up uh, every year for it when COVID isn't going on. Um, and we immediately started to make a whole bunch of friends and people started to uh, basically teach us. And we started to kind of repeal some of the things that we'd done, uh, take some of it down, uh, make sure that the things that we could do, we could do. Um, we even uh, at one point in time had a, uh, actually on several different occasions, different uh, priests of uh, the faiths uh, basically perform ceremonies on our stage. One of them was uh, more of a performance art. The other one was very much like a private thing um, that was done specifically for our tribe um, uh, at the event. Uh, A group of people, like a, a camp of people that all have a similar costume style is referred to as a tribe at the event. So I'm using like the, the in event vernacular there. Um, but yeah, uh, we've definitely had some times where people have criticized us and, uh, like, I feel like we do, like, we welcome the criticism, but at the same time, we've taken some steps to try and, uh, like be receptive on things. One of our members is to my understanding, a fourth generation priest. Um, and they live out in New Orleans. And um, I feel like we encountered uh, a few people that were more interested in uh, the, how do I put it? 
trying to work out a good way of navigating this, but um, uh, we we tried our best to follow the instructions um, of the uh, the people who were willing to give us the advice. Um, and even then, we still would receive the occasional scathing degree of criticism on things that we didn't feel we were actually doing. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I believe I'm pretty hopeful that we're going to, some of our topic tonight is going to be um, how we can navigate around some of that. Uh, I don't mean specifically for my tribe or anything like that, but uh, I know that a lot of people want to have interesting aspects for their character. And I think it's very easy for people who are LARPing to kind of fall into the trap that if it looks interesting, then they can just tack it onto their character without any real grounding to it. So it doesn't really make sense and they make it more of like an accessory. Um, but yeah, that, that's something I, I'm really enthusiastic to uh, kind of uh, kind of learn more about, especially with this uh, type of stuff. Uh, because like the more people I think being mindful in the LARP community of these these sort of things, is the better. And honestly, when it comes down to it, uh, I feel like LARP is probably one of the more common places that appropriation happens outside of things like, you know, uh, Hallmark greeting cards and uh, Halloween stores. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we are well over time, uh, but this is absolutely a discussion that we needed to have. Um, so I'm going to kind of close it out with, um, again, I found this amazing um, article on uh, verywellmind.com. I can probably link it below um, or in the chat, not below. Ha! Huh. Um, but I wanted to give you guys, um, they, they provide a really interesting list on how to avoid cultural appropriation. And I thought there was a couple of bullets in here um, that were very, very useful. And then I was going to go around... Um, around the, the screen and anyone who wanted to add to it, um, feel free to. Um, so how to avoid cultural appropriation. One is to give credit or recognize the origin of the items that you borrowed or promote from other cultures rather than claiming them to be your original ideas, which is echoing what Kelly had said earlier. Take the time to learn about and truly appreciate a culture before you borrow or adapt elements of that culture. Learn from those who are the members of the culture visit venues run by actual members of a culture such as restaurants and attend authentic events such as going to a real luau. I was actually going to say that I went to a, a powwow a couple of years ago and that was like the most amazing experience I've ever had. <laughs> um, and then finally support small businesses run by original members of a culture rather than buying mass product items from big box stores that are made to represent a culture. Some of my favorite bullet points there, but let's go ahead and go around the screen real quick. Any some adding, starting with Dr. Diana. Um, two things. So I would say that uh, this idea, so we know from, I'm gonna bring in the social psych research side now, which is one reason you all brought me. So uh, we know that perspective taking can be really effective in helping us to reduce prejudice and reach across differences. Um, and so reading a novel with the protagonist, even who's of another culture or experience than yours can be really beneficial. Um, and the difference with LARP is that if you're playing or portraying a character with a different experience, you don't have their voice as part of it, so unless you seek it out. So you are likely drawing on media portrayals, stereotypes, expectations, and assumptions in that. And so you're just reinforcing, unless you do the research, you may be at risk of reinforcing those things and just um, doing a caricature. And that means that you'll walk away feeling like you learned something and had an experience, but you might just be reinforcing some negative things or just things that pigeonhole folks and don't give them true richness. So that's my first point. My second point is uh, when you are approached and maybe somebody says, hey, what you did with this portrayal may be uncomfortable or misrepresent my culture, uh, take a step back and breathe, process, Maybe if you're not ready to have that conversation, it's even okay to say, I'm gonna be processing this. Thank you for this critique. Can I come back to you at another time? And we can have a discussion. If you're aware that you're not prepared to receive that commentary in that moment, if you're charged physically, for example, um, but hear the person because they have taken a risk and are vulnerable to tell you that. And they put themselves in a position to potentially have conflict. So honor that by respecting the fact that they made that choice and hear what they have to say. 
Yes. Uh, Kelly? That was amazing. Everything Diana just said. Um, I, I'll try to tack on something as uh, brilliant. Uh, I don't think I can. Um, one thing I would say is not just appreciating the culture, uh, especially for Native people. If you don't know someone who's Native, you you really should try to meet somebody who's Native. We're out there. We're around. Uh, please befriend uh, <laughs> our people. We, we, we're kind. We bite a little. But, but I swear, we make great things with corn. We love corn. Um, corn everywhere. Corn in my hair. Corn in other places. Corn. It's great. Um, but uh, I just want to say that, like, it, it's it, if you cannot become friends with one of us, maybe immediately in your own little circles, you don't know somebody in your LARP community, you don't know somebody in the geek community who is, there's a reason. We're actually incredibly geeky, and we have felt ostracized from those communities. Um, in order to let us to come in, like, start opening the door, maybe follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, really try to get informed about how to, like, incorporate us and not pretend like you know us but really listen and I think that's what's really important is like having a listening ear um and then on top of that especially when you know in terms of a, appropriation um if you have done something if you're like sitting here for a second and you're like oh shoot you know in that teenage years when I did that thing oh man like like take a moment to process that and pull that apart and ask yourself questions I think there's an important why that you need to ask yourself while while this is all being navigated like why am I choosing this and why is this important to me am I trying to see something greater here like what what is really going on am I con am I contributing to the conversation conversation or am I perpetuating uh, a consistent myth that is uh, contributing to someone's erasure and somebody's um, lack of uh, lack of like um, I, not lack but like um, reaffirming the stereotypes of someone's identity? So, re so really, take a step back and just like think, think about the choices you're making. Just be deliberate, and I, I really do think have fun and be respectful too. You know, that's that's really my thing. Like, I love playing in all different corners. And if someone came up to me and said that was disrespectful, I would take a step back and say, I am so sorry. I'm going to change or modify. It's not betraying me and the choices I'm making, but it's honoring something greater, as Diana has said. So, yeah. Ryan? So for me, like, uh, um, I do have a simple litmus test that, that will help um, when you're creating a character. And I'm just going to... Uh, and I may have mentioned this in the podcast in passing, but I kind of thought it was useful. Um, so when you're creating a character, um, I'm just going to use example gay because I am gay. It's like, are you creating a gay? <laughs> and I say this because um, if you're creating a gay, it kind of puts in all of the stereotypes into that character. Um, but you also can translate that to, am I creating a Mexican? Because then you suddenly, by putting, by trying to play a character that is just an identity, you suddenly have all of these stereotypes because it's not a fully realized character that you are creating. So if that is your concept, you should um, either try to root it in a real life story or what you do is you take that identity and use it as a modifier for an occupation. Am I a gay? scientist am i a mexican diplomat i am i a um am i a filipino nurse is it a stereotype yes but if you have that identity as a modifier it colors the experiences and makes that occupation richer rather than saying i identify and really really like this identity so i want to have that as my character and that's where we kind of get into trouble when you want you like a culture so much that it's literally all about culture and people say you know that's how you produce weebs like yeah a little bit <laughs> but um if you give it a life and you give it an occupation and you give it something to do then it makes that character rich because you have now embraced it with a particular background that you are inspired by and you don't fall into the trap of a lot of stereotypes well said. Um, Kai, would you like to say something? Sure. Once I find my mic. Um, so, uh, like I've been, I've been trying to absorb everything that 
people have been saying, and I'm uh, thinking back on some of the things that I've done over LARPing, and I know some of the things that I've done have been, at the time, seemed completely harmless, and other times have been, wow, that was super fucked up. Um, one of the important things to do is uh, learn. Uh, you don't know and everything. Um, taking things as a learning experience and how to make sure that more people are having fun around you uh, should absolutely be the focus. Um, me personally, when it comes to uh, trying to create a character, I get, I am a very uh, like artistic person. I am driven very much by the visuals of things. So when I see cool um, uh, outfits that are a little more on the handmade side or more natural side of things that infer much more of like a, a native or uh, more like a cooperative uh, like creation or uh, interaction with the environment around them uh, using hides and uh, other kinds of materials that are less refined than modern society in like big cities does. Um, it's very easy to fall into uh, the trick where uh, you grab those kinds of things and you don't really explain why, you just have accessorized your character. Uh, a costume is a costume if you treat it like a costume, especially for LARP. Um, if you treat the way that you build your character as, uh, sorry, more specifically, if the way that you dress your character is based on their identity and the things that they do, you are gonna uh, do a lot better. Um, like if your character is a hunter and you want to make some like improvised tools for hunting, then you know you can think about the materials that are available in the environment that your character exists in. Yeah, you can start looking at the way that uh, some tribes and cultures across the world have or do actively make and you can use those for inspiration um but try you know if there's different materials available around try doing them in different materials if you're creating a character in a post-apocalyptic environment maybe a lot of the resources you have are things like uh usb cables and now you're going to strip those and try and make some interesting decorations or braided things uh, out of them. Um, those techniques might be similar to the cultures that you're uh, uh, trying to show appreciation for, um, but they're not actually the same thing. And it's this kind of idea for our uh, listeners uh, on the podcast. I'm like using my hands together at the moment. It, it's from what I understand, it's a bit more of a parallel versus directly copying something. Um, so choosing a, a detail because it looks cool creates a character that's only skin deep. And if you really want to LARP and you really want to play a person, then you need to start treating other cultures as people, not as accessories and costumes. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, so real quick, I'm just going to leave my, my little anecdote and then we're going to go around and, and talk about socials. And I have a little bit of a, a little twist with the social that I'd like to add in there. Um, I know Diana my, has one quick thing. As yeah, well. I had one quick thing to tack on to what Kaya said. Sorry. I really liked what you said about that. And I think having more open conversations about that in our communities and our message boards on our Facebook groups, where we invite each other to talk about those choices we're making and people can model for their peers, what that looks like and folks who might see that costume and be like that's a caricature would know the thinking that went behind it and might not be triggered by seeing that in the moment at the LARP uh I think that's a really great thing we can do to broaden community so that's pretty close what I was going to actually leave with the with the anecdote there but um specifically like navigate the uh discussion don't harp on a person right away like Go find out what they did, and then you can deem whether or not they were being a pro appropriative. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> that word. Um, because sometimes you will find that the person who is wearing such and such thing actually did a lot of research and a lot of uh, like appreciation of the culture and a lot of like detail that went into it and navigate the discussion. If you're feeling uncomfortable about it and that person did do a lot of research on it, like just really talk about it with each other and really try to figure out like what is it that makes you feel uncomfortable so that person who did a lot of research 
may either be able to educate and help or understand why it's making you feel uncomfortable. And I think somebody already said this and be able to remove and adapt to that situation. Um, but I would really like to put it out there. Like don't harp on, on people right away. Like I know, I know we're offended and I know that we're hot headed about it and God forbid, like we are doing something wrong. Have a discussion. We are all human and we all make mistakes. Um, Okay, we're gonna wrap it up real quick because some of us gotta go to a bio break. <laughs> but um, so real quick, we're gonna go around, we're gonna do socials. And then the one thing that I wanted everyone to talk about real quick of your culture, what is that one piece of food? Because I'm hungry. What is that one piece of food that identifies your culture? And Ryan, I swear to God, you better say lumpias. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're gonna start off with Dr. Diana. Thank you again for joining yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. My socials are, I'm uh, Dr. Diana Leonard on Twitter as well as Instagram. Is that the kind of thing you're looking for? Yes, yes, yes. And my food is uh, gumbo. Definitely Creole culture is gumbo. And I think it's this fantastic example of Creole culture and of the, the, uh, everything that we've been talking about, really, because uh, it's food that's from the place where you are and what you can get to make it. The word gumbo is from the word for okra in West African language. It was brought over through awful means, but brought over and then thriving and surviving. It has been uh, blended with indigenous culture, with the use of um, the filet, the gumbo filet, which uh, is used to thicken the sauce. And that's the way my family cooks it. So I just love how it represents so much beauty about cultural exchange and, uh, and who my people are. So oh, I love it. And when my sister and I make it, it's amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Miss Kelly. It is such a pleasure to have you on here. Thanks for having me. Indian food, excuse me, Native American food. Don't call people Indian. We can call ourselves Indian. I'm gonna say it again. Indian food uh, is complex <laughs> uh, dynamicism. Uh, I grew up like I hate to admit it. We are all gonna say it if you're Native. Uh, fry bread is kind of like the thing, uh, but it has a really interesting history, and we're trying really hard to kind of have like a new resurgence of food uh, celebration that we had prior to colonialism. So um, I would actually say like fucking pizza, like and like. Like, look at everything with tomatoes in it. And just, like, every single thing that you think that you have in your culture, uh-uh, that's recent. That's recent. Tomatoes, very interesting enough. Your people thought we were trying to poison with them because you guys didn't cultivate it correctly. So every single time you eat that delicious, red, juicy tomato sauce on anything that you put it on, that's thanks to us. Social Deb. I'm, bow I'm bowing slowly. Oh, sorry. I got too excited, <laughs> got too excited about food. Uh, and generally corn. <laughs> just corn um <laughs> you can follow me at kelly lynn dang that's k-e-l-l-y-l-y-n-n-e-d-a-n-g on the twitter and i guess instagram not as quite active there but uh, i talk a lot on twitter so find me there yay kai hit us with oh, the God. socials and some food i, I want to um, know about some british food by the way oh my uh okay so socials are yokai props uh that's y-o-k-a-i-p-r-o-p-s you can find me on most, most places if you want to see some of my dumb art uh you'll probably go to instagram if you want to see me yell at people uh you can check uh twitter uh those are the variety of things um in regards to uh british food i was thinking about this a couple of times and honestly, uh, like half of the things that I love about English food are things that they have uh, taken from other cultures and because they conquered them and then co-opted it into whatever they wanted. Uh, and that happens just a hell of a lot when it comes to white culture. Uh, but one of the things that I think is irrepressible about uh, the British nature is their absolute love of cakes. Um, so there are... <laughs> Uh, a variety of things by this silly brand called Mr. Kipling, and if you are from England, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But um, yeah, I, I'm waving around uh, a, a box of these things called Battenbergs. Uh, they're very tasty. If you have any doubts or curiosities about what a Battenberg is, go on Netflix. The Great British Break Off has a, an entire episode about it. It's quite funny. Um, very charming, very wholesome, you know, cakes. <laughs> We do love our cakes. Nice. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to find the link real quick to the um, article that I was citing so I could put it in chat real quick for people. Um, Ryan Omega, 
All right. Uh, you could find me on Twitter under Ryan OMGA. I'm starting to get a lot more active on Twitter now. Uh, my Instagram, which I'm not as um, active on, but you could find me on Ryan Omega. Um, I also have a um, Facebook as well. And you could find me here on Life Action Roleplay with a lot of programming next week. Um, I'll save that for later. But if you are familiar with what we do, we do a lot of role playing streams such as Boardroom Devils next week. Um, and we're going to be bringing back at popular demand tarot and talk when we're going to start doing a lot more of the tarot primers. And I have very special guests for that. Um, the food that represents us, as Sin called it, it would be lumpia. Um, it's one of the few things that I could make. But if you want to go really, really deeply ethnic uh, Filipino, um, some people know this delicacy known as balot. I cannot eat balot. But if you want to look at it, basically it's um, fertilized duck egg that is not hatched. I cannot eat it because it grosses me out, but it is a Filipino delicacy that's very, very Filipino. I've never heard it. Wow. I'm going to have to look that up. That's... You won't, you uh, don't look it up immediately. Um, instead, I would go with Kelly's suggestion of eating pizza. I want pizza so badly right now. Copy. <laughs> Yeah, you can I'm thank super... natives for that. I'm, I'm like job. Thank you, natives, for the pizza. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, y'all can find me on Instagram, Cynthia underscore underscore Marie, where I post all of the behind the scenes pictures of all the different shows that I'm on. There's so many of them. If you want to know about them, look at my story or look at my Twitter at Sindancer. That's where I also comment on a bunch of different things or I talk about mental health. Um, I am openly with um, generalized anxiety disorder. So I talk a lot about that and do a lot of charity work for it um that being said i have a whole bunch of stuff on there like just go look for my links and we've been talking for a while and i'm hungry so i'm gonna leave you with some puerto rican food platanos sweet plantain totones, mofongo everything is made with bananas and avocado um rice and beans or arroz con habichuela um all of that food is amazing so if you want an authentic puerto rican food rice and beans your choice of protein lots of avocado and some sort of banana with that everyone love you guys and bye, bye. bye. we're going to raid i think oh yeah okay yeah oh yeah uh, we're, raiding? we're gonna raid our friend kiri oh uh, kiri yeah because kiri is yeah curiosity because um she is amazing and you know, say hi, mm -hmm. and uh, we're so happy to have you. <laughs>